Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about video games. Today I'm talking about the games released in 2023 that I think were the best. I played 43 games that released last year, and it was a really good year for gaming. I enjoyed so many of these. Here's a full list of the ones I played if you want to check it out. I do have more than 10 games that I really liked, so I'm going to start off with a few honorable mentions. Thirsty Suitors by Outerloop Games is a delightful blend of dating sim, turn-based combat, skateboarding, and cooking game. You play Jala, who returns to her hometown after an abrupt departure, having to deal with the family, friends, and exes she left behind. The game just oozes charm, with Jala performing acrobatics as she fights and cooks, and conversations, especially with her parents, are sweet and feel very real. Every time Jala fell asleep on her dad's shoulder while watching TV, my heart melted a little. Of all the Metroidvanias I've played this year, After Image is the one that impressed me the most. With a beautiful painted look and an incomprehensible story, you get to explore and battle through an incredibly expansive world. There are a ton of different weapons and equipment to collect, allowing you to customize your character and how she plays to a large degree. Platforming and combat are both a lot of fun, and the world is filled with interesting enemies and boss fights. Though it doesn't bring that much new to the table, it kept me exploring for many hours. Near the end of the year, I found the perfect cozy game to while away some hours with. Black Skylands by Hungry Couch Games is a top-down shooter. You play Eva, who needs to defend her world from raiders and a mysterious swarm. You traverse the world both in a skyship and on foot as you engage in battles, collect materials, and solve puzzles. The gameplay loop of clearing an island of all enemies, collecting its resources, and going back to the father ship to upgrade your weapons and ship is really pleasing. It's the perfect game to play while catching up on podcasts or YouTube videos. And now it's time for the top 10. Number 10 is a visual novel that turns the cliché of rescuing the princess on its head. It's Slay the Princess. You're on a path in the woods, and at the end of that path is a cabin. And in the basement of that cabin is a princess. You're here to slay her. Developed by Black Tabby Games, in Slay the Princess, you start out in a forest. A narrator tells you that you must find a cabin which contains a princess, and you need to kill her, or she'll end the world. You get tons of options. Question this instruction, seek out the cabin, refuse to move at all. Once you find the princess, she's not exactly what you expect, and how she reacts to you depends on your own behavior. She may be sweet and innocent, or a possible romance option. She may be acerbic and critical. She may be a monster. Whatever you decide, you'll find yourself in the woods again, faced with the same task and how you'll respond to it this time. This game does a wonderful job of maintaining a tense atmosphere and often dips into body horror or ghastly spectacle. The princess and narrator are superbly voice acted, giving life to multiple different iterations of each. And the visuals are striking pencil drawings. Your every action has a different result, and the overall writing and story is a real treat. This is one that I wanted to play a few times over to see all the different outcomes that were possible. Number 9 is a unique take on 80s slashers that puts you in the role of a radio DJ. It's Killer Frequency. Hello, Collar. You're live on the stream with me, Forrest Nash. In Team 17's first-person horror puzzler, you are hosting a late-night show on a small-town radio station. In the midst of spinning records, running ads, and taking calls, the local 911 operator contacts you to say that a killer is on the loose. They've attacked the police station and are looking for more victims. Emergency calls are routed to the radio station, and you need to talk people through their emergencies. 
you need to walk someone through a corn maze and find the best nearby options for hiding or help. Who lives and who dies is up to you. While most of the game takes place in the booth with just your producer behind the glass to help you out, occasionally you need to leave and fetch items in the station. This can be pretty spooky. Uncover the truth behind this killer and their motivations and keep the town safe, if you can. The voice acting here is really good, plus the story kept me wrapped the whole time. While it can be spooky, it's also quite humorous. Plus, it was a very novel concept, something not quite like any game I had played before. The puzzles were quite clever, and it was a test to see if I could make the right choices and keep everyone alive. Games based on existing properties can be a real crapshoot, but this one captured the source material and was just a lot of fun to play. Number 8 is Robocop Rogue City. It seems there will be trouble. Developed by Taeon, Rogue City puts us in control of everyone's favorite cyborg, voiced by the original Peter Weller. The game takes place between the second and third movies, and though I've only seen the first, I never felt like I was missing anything. This game really surprised me. I expected a competent first-person shooter. Cyborg skills that let me target punks and shoot them in the dick, the ability to take a lot of bullets, a powerful hand cannon. And I got those things. But I also got a kind of adventure game where I got to walk around the precinct or around downtown Detroit, helping people and maintaining order. There are choices to make everywhere. Whether you help out the new recruit who everyone is picking on, how you respond to people asking for help, if you let someone doing graffiti off with a warning or give them a ticket, even which, if any, mayoral candidate you want to support. You choose whether it's more important to uphold order or protect the public trust. You'll also be talking to a therapist and figuring out if you see yourself as a man or machine. The writing, and Robocop's dialogue in particular, is so incredibly earnest that it's often hilarious. I had such a good time with this game. Climbing is something that happens in a lot of games, but it always tends to be a rather frictionless experience. Not here, though. Number 7 is Jusong. I always love when Don't Nod makes a game that isn't in the Life is Strange formula, and Jusan is another winner for me. The few hours I spent with it were chill and relaxing, almost meditative, but it also required enough thought and planning to keep me engaged and wanting to constantly push forward. You play an unnamed character and your goal is to climb an impossibly tall tower. There is some backstory tucked away in notes, but for the most part, you just climb. The control scheme here is really neat, allowing you to choose which handheld to reach for with the left stick and reach for it with the left or right trigger. You can place pitons as you climb, allowing you a kind of checkpoint in case you take a fall. You have to manage your stamina and shake out your forearms when you get tired. New mechanics are introduced frequently to keep things fresh, as you'll be able to make plants bloom or hang on to moving critters. Later, you'll have to deal with wind or turn to your little blob companion to impact the environment around you. Along the way, there are secrets to find and so many beautiful sights to behold. Jusant is a really lovely game. I love computer role-playing games, and this is the biggest one that's come out in years. Number six is Baldur's Gate 3. Very good. Now just tell me I'm beautiful and we can call it a day. Larian has been doing its best to reinvigorate the CRPG genre over the last number of years. And though this isn't my favorite of their games, it certainly took the gaming world by storm, making a rather niche genre available and approachable to people who may never have considered it before. It does a fantastic job of combining crunchy role-playing and turn-based combat with some great and lovable characters and Bioware-style conversations and cinematics. Every conversation with any character in the game is amazing. The writing, the voice performances, the sparkle in their eyes and gestures as they talk, it makes the prodigious amount of dialogue stay exciting. And the world is just full of things to discover, encounters that can change dramatically based on your decisions. 
I've had well-meaning choices go terribly wrong, been able to save the day, or had some quests I just couldn't manage to finish. Act 1 of the game, in particular, is fantastic. I sunk at least 20 hours into it just the first weekend after release, and loved every minute of them. The pure amount of choice you get, both mechanically and narratively, is really quite astonishing, and some of the quests and little stories I got to take part in are going to stick with me. Number 5 is just a fantastic horror game. It's the Dead Space remake. The original Dead Space came out in 2008 and pretty quickly established itself as one of my favorite horror games. I debated on where, or even if I should put this game in my top 10, as it is technically a remake. However, Motive Studio didn't just upscale things or use a new engine. They refined, they added, they made the characters better. It's not the same game as much as it retains the spirit of the original. You play engineer Isaac Clarke aboard the seemingly defunct mining ship, the USG Ishimura. Space horror is my favorite subgenre, and Dead Space just has impeccable vibes. It's tense, it's scary, filled with incredible sound design and horrible silence. The necromorphs you fight are upsetting, needing to be dismembered rather than just shot, and the abilities you get really need to be managed well in order to survive. The Ishimura is such an immersive location, a huge, continuous ship that you really learn the layout of as you play. And the game has one of the best UIs. It's super minimal. It offers navigation help when you need it, but also no safety. There's no pausing when you need to use a vending machine or fuss with your inventory. You're always in danger. I had an amazing time playing this with a friend, passing the controller back and forth, making sure no one got too scared, or missed a shiny object that needed to be picked up. This game takes everything great from the original and makes it even better. Number 4 is a game that came out of nowhere, but I was so happy to get it. It's Hi-Fi Rush. Yep, that's me. And you're probably wondering how I ended up here. At the beginning of 2023, Tango Gameworks and Bethesda announced, and on the very same day released, the rhythm action game Hi-Fi Rush. I think this was a surprise to everyone. It somehow wasn't leaked earlier, and Tango's last games were in the horror genre. Hi-Fi Rush has you playing Chai, a man who dreams of becoming a rock star and is about to undergo cybernetic limb replacement at a sketchy super corporation. Something happens during this process, and Chai is now able to see and feel music all around him. Every single thing in this game happens on the beat. Attacking and parrying enemies, the rise and fall of platforms, puffs of smoke coming out of smokestacks, Chai snapping his fingers. The art and animation is remarkable, with everything looking like it comes out of a bright and colorful comic book. The original soundtrack rocks, as do the number of licensed tracks that appear at key moments and boss fights. Everything from Nine Inch Nails to Fiona Apple. I'm not great at these kinds of rhythm combo games, but Hi-Fi Rush includes so many accessibility and gameplay options that I was able to tailor it to be something I found fun and manageable. The game only gets more fun as it goes, as Chai meets and teams up with other characters who add both new abilities and heartfelt and hilarious conversations. Hi-Fi Rush was a real joy to play. The game in the third spot takes obvious inspiration from some classic shooters, but does so in a style all its own. It's El Paso Elsewhere. So let's take it from the top. Max is Dracula, Lord of the Vampires. 15 miles from here in a tiny motel in El Paso, Texas, she's conducting a ritual that will end the world as we know it. Strange Scaffold makes some weird and wonderful games. El Paso Elsewhere is one whose combination of music, story, aesthetic, and voiceover came together in a way that completely enraptured me. You play James, a drug addict who is hunting down his ex-girlfriend. 
She is Dracula, the lord of the vampires, and she's trying to end the world. Gameplay is very much inspired by Max Payne. You play in third person with an increasing arsenal of weapons and can slow down time to get the jump on enemies. The enemies are vampires, fallen angels, werewolves, puppets. Each level is quite quick. You need to fight, find and release hostages, and sometimes find keys in order to unlock doors and progress. It's a lot of fun to dive through the air as time slows down and you headshot the monsters around you. In between most levels, you'll get a small scene, some of the past between James and Dracula, thoughts in his head as he travels ever down into the depths, riding an elevator into hell as reality shifts and warps around you. James is presented as a neo-noir anti-hero with the perfect voice to narrate the story. Every story scene captures the thrill of a relationship that can seem like the best thing in the world and the worst at the same time. The music is a blend of hip-hop and electronic, with beats and lyrics that perfectly set the mood. Every element weaves together in a beautiful union of violence, exhilaration, and heartache. It's only going to get worse from here. And why do I feel so fucking good? My second favorite game this year is one that combines horror with an incredible amount of empathy. It's Stasis Bone Totem. Hello, I am Moses. What in hell? Is that human? Developed by the Brotherhood, this is the successor to 2015 Stasis, another game which made an appearance on my best of list that year. While that game took place in space, this one takes place in my second favorite kind of location for horror, deep within the ocean. You get to play as three different characters. Mac and Charlie are a couple who make their living salvaging in the ocean. They come upon an abandoned oil rig, the exploration of which takes them into the heart of darkness. They make horrifying discoveries about the ubiquitous Kane Corporation and how it functions to make technological, scientific, and even religious advancements. And they discover things that lay even deeper. But it's also an incredibly personal story. The third character is Moses, an AI toy who belongs to Mac and Charlie's dead daughter. All of them are coming to terms with her death and dealing with blame, guilt, and the prospect of moving on. The game plays out as a point-and-click adventure game, but with an isometric perspective. Each screen is filled with great detail. The cutscenes are really impressive for such a small team, and the writing and voice acting is top-notch. Exploration is rewarding as there is so much to discover, and the puzzles are both challenging and logical. They all mostly require you to pay attention to your surroundings. Each character also has a certain set of skills, and you can pass items between them to interact with them differently. Being able to hear the protagonists communicate with each other the whole time really makes the story engrossing as each character is pushed to their limits and the stunning conclusion is reached. I am the cleverest bear. And finally, my favorite game of the year is the best game so far from a studio I always love. It's Alan Wake 2. In a horror story, there are only victims and monsters. And the trick is not to end up as either. It's been 13 years since the first Alan Wake, a game I've always loved. And I'm glad Remedy took their time coming out with this sequel because they really hit it out of the park. Alan Wake is a writer who has been trapped in the dark place for 13 years, and he's trying to write his way out. Part of that involves the other character we play this time around. Saga Anderson is an FBI agent investigating a series of murders. You alternate playing them both. This sequel leans way more into survival horror than the first, as you need to carefully manage health and ammo. The atmosphere is much more tense, and there were times it truly scared me. What makes this game special is how hard it leans into its themes of art and how it affects the world around us. Alan can write his way through dead ends. New powers and abilities are obtained through written words. And it's not just writing. 
we see the world change through photography, film, and music. The game looks spectacular, and going from the rendered characters to their actual filmed actor counterparts seamlessly is always impressive. While Saga's chapters were generally more fun to play with exciting combat, creative puzzles, and an idea board to put the story together, Alan's chapters were amazing audio-visual experiences. One musical scene in the game had me grinning from ear to ear the whole time. Hearing narration from the detective Alan created gives things a wonderful noir feeling, while seeing FMV commercials or radio broadcasts from town locals is absurdly comedic. Alan Wake 2 is just a phenomenal example of merging many kinds of media and art with gameplay to create an unforgettable experience. No, Ilmo. I'm very busy wearing a turtleneck and drinking wine like an asshole. So those were my favorite games of 2023. It really was a good year for horror. I hope that you enjoyed the video and maybe found a game or two that you want to play for yourself. Leave me a comment and let me know what your favorite games of the year were and what you're looking forward to playing this year. If you want to see more, check out my best of list from last year, or check out one of my other videos. I have a Patreon if you want to support the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.